Hello. This is great. This is a good turnout. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, obviously, I get to ask all the first questions, uh, and you have to listen, and then you get to ask the questions uh, that, that you may have at the end. So before that, I get stuck. Um, so there's a thousand questions I want to ask, and we're definitely not going to get through all of them. Uh, I wrote them on one piece of paper. I tried to make it fit on one piece of paper. Um, and I'd like to start with one of the first things that you started. Actually, I want to start even earlier than that. I want to start by you telling the story of how you ended up in San Francisco, because I think it's <laughs> such, when, when you understand that, you understand how random life can be. Um, it's when, very random. When you hear the story Indeed. from what comes after. Um, so I was, I was planning on climbing a bunch of mountains in Nepal, and I uh, came on my way to, I was on my way to Nepal actually, and my sister who had moved to San Francisco, um, I hadn't seen her for a while. So I decided to stop in and I had my ice axe and I had my backpack and I had my crampons and I was like all kind of geared up for my big trek through the Himalayas. And um, I showed up in my sister's apartment because San Francisco was cheap enough that people had spare bedrooms in those days. My sister had a spare bedroom, which is unheard of. Like, you know, just to, I don't know, like, put your winter clothes in? Like, it was crazy. And so she, she being my lovely older sister, just kind of put me up there. And then my, my trip got canceled eventually. It, it kind of became avalanche season. Like, some guy got injured, we didn't end up going. And so I just hung out in my sister's spare bedroom for about six months until she finally said, hey, have you ever thought of getting a job? <laughs> and so, you know, this being 1994 in um, Silicon Valley, the most interesting thing that's going on right there is the web. And it had just appeared and I had seen Mosaic Browser come out and um, I was a artist. I had actually um, planned on getting a PhD in Renaissance literature. That was my thing. Um, I was also a painter. And um, I felt that I could use my skills in um, kind of, you know, aesthetics to um, become a designer. So I taught myself HTML, like, like, like I, one of my neighbors was working at the very first web design company. And so um, there were no books about how to, how to design for the web. It just, it kind of didn't exist. You had to do it by viewing the source code on each page. Um, and so I accepted a job offer on Friday, not having any idea what I was doing. And I was like, I went to my sister and I was like, I didn't even have a computer. And I said, um, Corey, could we go to your office this weekend so I could try to teach myself HTML? So it was like that. It was kind of a, it was a super scrappy, I kind of um, bluffed my way into the job. Um, and it was just a series of accidents, truly a series of accidents. And I think just as interesting as how you ended up being in San Francisco, um, how you came to interact with the web at all in the first uh, oh, in the, the, in I the mean, first instance. Yeah, so um, I was really lucky in that I was I was kind of on the web very early, but I was a huge fan of um, Jorge Luis Borges, the writer. Is anybody like a lover of this writer? Yes, yes. I high five you from over here. The the um, so Borges is an Argentinian writer, and he anticipated in many of his essays. This is a very friendly fern. Um, you have a you have a harassment policy, right? Um, here. You, you can move a bit closer. <laughs> um, the the um, the I, I joined a group of Borges scholars. I found a bunch of Borges scholars online in like Denmark who I contacted, and like it was my first sense of how how amazing the internet could be because I was like, like engaging in conversations with, with these folks and, and I had been like, this is kind of like super historical, right? But I had been really into zines and zine culture and we had like made and published our own zines and kind of mailed them to each other. Like this is, this is kind of like the internet, like, like talk about like snail mail. Like it's, it was like, it was kind of like the slowest possible internet, but it was kind of very internet-y. And so that was kind of how I originally got into it. And I was always very into kind of independent culture and independent publishing. And you know, that was kind of where I came from and how I got so interested in the internet because it just seemed as if it was this amazing force for um, liberating people's voices and opportunities for people who hadn't had any chance to, um, you know, publish anything and have immediate 
global distribution. I mean, just like all those things that kind of people talk about and about the internet, we've all kind of gotten used to, right? And it, 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 you know, you know, these things that are so wondrous, you know, become just part of your daily life and you kind of somehow don't see it anymore, but that was what it was. That's what got me into it. Yeah, and I think that that perfect, I mean, that's like the perfect introduction to your um, career as an entrepreneur is that it seems that it's very much centered around community. And if you look at the driving force, both of you as an investor and entrepreneur, community just comes and comes again. Um, and can we start with Flickr and just, can you give us, uh, I think Flickr is an interesting example on many levels. One, um, on how important keeping an open mind and being well, happy to pivot is. Uh, and I, if you can tell, tell us a bit about the never ending game um, and uh, how you decided to transition, that'd be great. And then, of course, um, at, as a beginning of a form of social media, if you could give us an, a, a couple stories about the Flickr's beginnings. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, there was... Flickr was not something that looked like it would be successful. There was not a lot of capital around, actually. We were building it in Canada, in Vancouver. We were building a game, initially. The game had... Um, many, many passionate users. It was amazing, but we absolutely could not get it funded. We were um, only one person out of the five person team was actually getting paid. The rest of us were just kind of scraping along. I actually put, I had bought, I had bought my first apartment and I put not just one, but two mortgages on it in order to make the one guy's payroll to make this company. And we were eating, you know, this kind of an exaggeration because we were we probably had some vegetables, but it seemed like we were eating like noodles for dinner every night, right? Um, <laughs> so it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't quite, it wasn't, um, it was, it was a fairly scrappy operation, honestly. And, and we were just about to give up. We were just about to give up and like throw in the tile and quit and close down the company. When it turned out we had, we had this idea for this um, kind of a photo sharing platform and um, decided to scrap the game and start working on this photo sharing platform. But we only had like a couple, like we really didn't have any money left. And so what had happened was we had applied for a grant to the Canadian government for this game and we had been rejected for it. But apparently we had checked this box that said resubmit it for next year and then we got it. And it was a couple of days before Christmas and we were literally just about to shut the whole thing down. And we got a letter from the Canadian government saying like, congratulations, here's a check for $75,000, which was like a fortune. And so that was what we started Flickr with. It was kind of an amazing, amazing moment. It was just a kind of a Hail Mary. And all these things in retrospect, you know, they're just extreme, like good fortune, hard work, unwillingness to quit, general unemployability in other jobs. Um, you know, I, these are kind of the qualities that I, I kind of attribute to my being an entrepreneur to begin with. Um, you know, just bullheadedness, unwillingness to quit. Like, the, like the, you, know, you know, I'm an investor now and I see these entrepreneurs and they're just like, you just want to say like, it's okay, to, it's okay to rest and stop and like quit and like chill and you know, it's even, it's even okay to like, you know, cut your losses and go do a new thing. Um, but there's a certain personality type that just doesn't stop. So I, I kind of am that kind of person. And what you didn't stop doing for quite a long time um, in the early days of Flickr and sort of for quite a long time after that um, was greeting new members. And a lot of people, greeting new members who had joined the community. So you'd insist on yes, not automating yes. that part of like the welcome messages. And yes, everything. and so we were, my background was, was in online community and I had even worked um, uh, really, really early on with a, a guy from The Well. The Well was the original online community, in my opinion. That was like a really fantastic online community where I learned everything I know about building communities and people speaking in their own voices and kind of how you build that. And so much of building that community is, is kind of that being involved with it every day and talking to and greeting and introducing people to each other and like, hey, you know, you know, Sandra from Minneapolis, you know, have you met like, you know, um, Keiko, who's also from Minneapolis, why don't you guys meet each other? You know what I'm saying? It kind of just basically being this sort of like kind of the infinite party host and, um, and really building that community. And, and I still am in touch with and have Christmas ornaments that have been made by members of this community, some of whom have gotten married, 
had children and gotten divorced at this point. So it's like it's kind of an amazing it's kind of an amazing story. It's like a, a real a real kind of real real community. You know when that's happening. And why do you think um, founders tend to delegate that as quickly as possible or try to automate it? And w why do you think they're wrong? Oh, it's crazy. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I, I got an I got an email from a kind of a not really a friend of mine, just acquaintance of mine who had an online community and things had gone really bad there. And there was like a, co a, a couple of really bad actors who were in there and they were kind of harassing everybody and being kind of ill-behaved and just awful. And he was like, it's shutting down my community and you know, all these people are leaving as a result. I'm like, dude, we, like, are you in there every day? Like, how did this get out of hand? He's like, he's been doing it for months. I'm like, that, like, that, you know, there's no excuse, get in there. Like, you're, you know, you're the, you're the captain of the ship. You know, you're ultimately in charge. You're the you're the CEO, and he said, "Yeah, yeah, but I hired a community manager." I'm like, "That you can't do that. Like, you can't just outsource this. You have to be part of you have to be part of the the building of it, the cultivating of it, the you know, um, gardening, right? The gardening of the community. You have to you have to have both fertilizer and weed killer, but most of all, you need to have you need to be the gardener. And um, I think that's a really important part of these things. And those things don't scale, and those things are, you know. You have to have one conversation at a time. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's kind of the only way that it can get done. And, um, you know, what's interesting is that everybody, I did a, I did a, um, a podcast uh, last year with Reed Hoffman. He has this, do you guys know Masters of Scale? Yes, um, and I did this. I did this conversation with him where we were talking about social media, and he's like, you know, social media, this, social media, that, and you know, Katarina, you were one of the progenitors, the you know, godmother of social media, and I'm like, we were not building social media, we were building online community. Social media is actually something that came later when they wanted to harvest your attention, when they wanted to harvest your data, and it was a very dangerous, and I think things went kind of in a direction that they had not been expected to go from those of us who were really early on in building online communities because when you could harvest people's attention, when you could build an activity feed, we could see this because Flickr had um, one of the very first activity feeds online and it was copied by a lot of social media companies. But what Facebook started to do is they started to organize it by attention. And there was a big outcry, like organizing things by what gets attention, it's kind of obvious what's gonna happen. What's gonna happen is the most sensational stuff is gonna go up there. What's gonna happen is the most sexist stuff, the most racist stuff, the most Seven deadly sins. divisive stuff, the stuff that is most politically polarizing stuff is gonna go up there. And when it turns out that you can actually buy your way on there, which we also kind of raised a hue and cry when that happened, what does that mean? That means that you cannot sell people just toothpaste but you can sell them ideology. And we see this happening every day. You go, you know, you go on YouTube, 70% of all of the videos that people watch on YouTube are recommended. And recommended videos are radicalizing, right? You know, the, the, um, you know, the New Zealand shooter in the mocks, he had been radicalized on YouTube. And you could actually see the pattern of his path through YouTube, but he had been kind of, um, kind of, kind of radicalized by the stuff there because they knew that that stuff grabs your attention. That stuff keeps you there. That stuff creates this compulsion to go back. And it's stimulating and it's sensational and you can't resist it. And it's very difficult to drive by a car accident. But if you look up, if you're just like a mom, right? You just, you're, you're a new mom and you've just had a baby. Um, within, they kind of, they did a bunch of tests on this. Within like five videos, you will start to be fed anti-vaccination propaganda. Like moms, right? Like people who are just like looking there to, for advice on kind of, you know, caring, for, caring, caring for babies. It happens like so crazy. And, and, and that, is, that, is comes, that comes from the transformation, I believe, from what we were building really early on which was online community and transforming it into social media, which means that they're just basically selling your attention. And it, it, there's no real um, kind of desire or strength in your kind of your human connections anymore. I mean, I think it's just, it's yeah. not just that. It's also that um, when you go from online community to social media, 
one of the implications is that you don't curate who's on the platform anymore and what they can say. Um, and I think that a good example of that mm -hmm. is your early days at Flickr. Yeah. I have no idea how this turned out to happen, but a lot of your users were in the UAE, so in the United Arab Emirates. Oh, it was crazy. It was, I know why. It was because there was a, there was a very um, popular blogger whose name was E. Fatima, and she um, had been a super active, she was a, like really, really big in UAE, and um, had become a member of the Flickr community. And then within, I think, six months, the like 90% of the population of United Arab Emirates between the ages of like 18 and 35 were on Flickr. <laughs> it was crazy. There's a there's no there's no screen here, but uh, but there's this like crazy diagram that we drew of our like of the Flickr community that was there. We eventually got um, shut down by the government. They just blocked us. So that was okay. that it didn't last for so long, but. You know. and, and the reason that happened was that because of the, what your decision on the Britney Spears? Uh, well, yeah, because there was a there was a there was an outcry against <laughs> there was a so there were a lot of women in in um, bathing suits and with bare midriffs, and this was this was this was this was not this was not okay. I think with perhaps the government, um, but interestingly, we were very active. We took a very active role in booting off white supremacists, people who were um, kind of, you know, behaving in kind of like sexist groups. There were like a lot of organizations that would kind of like appear, it's sort of a, the internet is a, um, you know, it can be the Wild West with no sheriff unless somebody kind of takes responsibility for it. And a lot of what you see out there right now comes from the difference between a founder who thinks of their, what they're building is a community versus a founder who thinks that what they're building is media because you kind of don't care whose eyeballs are there if you can sell them advertising appropriate to them, right? If you can sell them, if you, can, if you have a bunch of, if you have a large white supremacist community and you can sell them white supremacist, the people are willing to kind of sell white supremacist ads, then your business model, um, if you are oriented towards being a kind of a media company, just kind of dictates that. So it's, a, it's just a very different way of looking at things. And I think that we just always had a very different way of looking at things because we thought of ourselves as a community. Yeah, and you, you, you mentioned that one of the earliest people to work at um, Flickr said that you're just as bad as the worst thing that you tolerate on your platform. Yes, and that's Heather Champ, who is the community manager. She, and she said, you are what you tolerate. So if you tolerate, um, you know, if you tolerate white supremacists, you're a white supremacist platform. And Simplister, <laughs> period. That's what you are. And so how, how do you think that that should impact the way that, you know, both upstarts in the um, social media space and yeah, I mean, bigger I, players should, should I act? I mean, you know, it's really funny because I get in arguments with all of my colleagues who are all kind of like, well, the algorithm is neutral. The algorithm is not neutral. <laughs> People have built the algorithms, right? There's a kind of a black box in Google and in Facebook, and there's a bunch of engineers in a room, and you know, like our governments, you know, kind of are are visible to us, and they're creating laws, and um, you know, they're elected officials, and we can see what they believe, and we can see how they vote, and there's a lot of reasons why that is all very public, right? Um, because you want to you want to create a, a fair platform for everyone. Um, but what's happening is that all of that power is actually shifting onto these um, platforms and you can't see who's making the rules, right? You can't see who's writing the, the algorithms. You can't see, there's no, there's no you know, Senate or city council or, you know, it's, 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 it's invisible to us. And yet those are kind of like decisions that are being made about like our experiences in, in media and like, you know, in the US, um, you know, the FCC uh, regulates the media, but you know, there's this sort of loophole that all the tech companies have gotten through by calling themselves a platform. You know, it's just, you know, if, um, you know, if uh, all of these people Google bomb um, a picture of Mich Michelle Obama as a monkey and Sergey Brin steps up and says, well, it's just the algorithm talking. Like, just boggles the mind to me. Like, I, just to me, it just seems like this, this great. Um, um, they're just, they're just absolving themselves of responsibility, right? It's kind of a huge fig leaf for neglect and 
of uh, responsibility. And I, I also hear, it's funny, because I also get in arguments with people about the First Amendment, too. And the First Amendment in, in the United States is the freedom of speech. And the freedom of speech is incredibly important. It's very important for democracy. But what freedom of speech in the First Amendment is meant to address is when the government is jailing journalists, not when companies are writing software, because we are the, you know, empresses of our domains, right? We actually can, can decide what those values and mores are that are represented on our platforms. So I, I think that there's this very libertarian, techno-libertarian outlook in the value, which I'm very different. I, I'm just, I just come from a very different orientation. I don't say that, like, no, I have no responsibility. The algorithms are neutral. I, I'm using the kind of the First Amendment as a kind of a fig leaf, right? Um, that uh, I, I come out on a very different side on that equation. And I do think that the, <coughs> the life experiences of the people that are building the software also very much dictates who, who builds it. Because like, think about it, like if, if these platforms had built by, for example, women, they'd just be a lot, like, what they would be, how would they be different? Like, ask a friend of, a friend of mine this, like if, if these platform firms were built by women. Well, number one, she said, they'd be, they'd be safer that have been built into it from the start. So, I, I mean, I come from, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a bit of an outlier in the valley. I don't look like, um, apparently, uh, my cab driver told me this, like, the reason there's so much traffic is because Mark Zuckerberg is in town. <laughs> I don't know if he's here for Viva Tech, but, um, uh, you know, I think, that, I think that if you come from, like, a very privileged kind of um, background, and you're, you're like this, you know, you, you kind of like, you're protected by this veil of kind of white male privilege that you, 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 there's a lot of things that you just don't see. And so actually coming to that, uh, after Flickr, um, you got a bit of money from the, the acquisition via Yahoo and one of the first investments, or maybe the first investment that you made. It was the second investment. Second investment that you made uh, was yeah. in Etsy. Was in Etsy. And I think Etsy is just an amazing example of something that's often talked about but not really described with examples, which is the companies that could have been had or, or that almost were not because there are so few women investors. Um, yeah, uh, and yeah. I, yeah, if you can tell us. Yeah, and this was like 2006, great. and so there weren't a lot of like, there were, there were, as far as I knew, there actually weren't any investors in the Valley that kind of looked like me, right? Who were kind of like, like a former entrepreneur, right? And it, like, God damn, like if there had been a, a, a woman, like kind of former entrepreneur investor, I would have like run to her door, right? But they, I, I, there weren't any. There were, there were women investors, but they were very similar to the male investors too. They were kind of, they had finance backgrounds. They're just, you know, I think it was just maybe the tech industry wasn't mature enough that enough women had had successful exits that they could then become investors. And so um, when I saw Etsy, it was very obvious to me. I'm like, okay, so this is a marketplace for handmade goods. There's all these women, you know, and I literally took it to like Reid Hoffman who said, so, this is a bunch of women knitting sweaters and selling it to selling them to each other. And I'm like, yes! I was like, this is like, it's such an opera, huge opportunity. Um, and he was like, I'm not, I'm not seeing it. And um, and part of the reason I think that um, you know I could I could kind of see this is because it's a part of a movement. It was very clear that there was this huge movement starting, and we're talking about this is like 2005, six, or whenever that investment was made, right? And um, it was a bunch of women knitting sweaters and selling them to each other, right? Like, but, like, but it's huge. Everybody was rebelling at that time against you know, mass commercialism and big box retail and Walmart and like, what's the equivalent here? Darfur. Yes, and what you know, and and you know all that kind of thing, and wanted things that were made by hand by people with with names and faces, and this is like, this grandma from Illinois made my candle, right? And this was like the whole like, the entire next decade was about this. And it was right? more than that, because like the buyers were the sellers, and the buyers were the sellers. It was like a huge community of people who kind of all knew each other, and. Um, and it was, a, it was a kind of an amazing thing, but it's, it's sort of invisible, I think, um, to people who were not on these websites that were growing up. They were like blowing up of like knitting patterns. Like, you know, this kind of, anyway, so it was- it, And Reid Hoffman doesn't knit. He doesn't, he doesn't, as far as I know, he doesn't knit. Um, another investment that was in a, in a 
similar, well, that share has some similarities with Kickstarter, um, which in a sense is an enabler of communities because it helps yes, people yes. Um, um, fund projects that otherwise probably would not be funded. And, and I think it's, I think there's a there's a thread. There's a common thread in all of the things that 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 I have made, and the the thread is that. Um, is is literally going back to the, those days when I was like making and publishing, like literally photocopying zines and sending it to a bunch of other weirdos who are doing the same thing, um, to Flickr, which is a platform for photography, to Etsy, which was a platform for makers of all stripes, DIY folks and, and everything like that. And then getting to the point where crowdfunding was possible and people could start their projects. I mean, like, you know, I don't know, Spike Lee's like funding his movies on Kickstarter. It's crazy, right? And and um, and building a platform to enable that. I invested in it when it was like literally a PowerPoint deck. Like it, like these guys, neither of the guys knew how to code. Like it was ridiculous. Like they, one one guy had been um, Perry had been I, th you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Perry. If you're out there, I don't, I don't actually know if this is a story, but. From what I understand, he was like a day trader, right? He was like trading, he was like one of those people like kind of like trades online. And he would take breaks occasionally, go down to this cafe. And the waiter at his cafe was Yancey Strickler, who became his co-founder. And these guys are not, I love this. This is, the, this is what I look for, I love this. When people who do not look, when you scratch them, they don't smell like an entrepreneur. Like they're these kind of like, kind of, th that's frankly my specialty. Those are the people that I invest in, right? Like this guy, he's like 48 years old. He's been a short order cook for like 30 years. Like that's my guy. Like I love these, like these are the entrepreneurs I look for like as an investor because I have always found that people from unusual backgrounds with different perspectives, with just, you know, coming from some other industry or some other perspective that is is very different from the the, kind of status quo. I mean, look at me, like I don't fit in, right? I don't fit in there with all my kind of techno libertarian, kind of the Travis Kalanix and, uh, you know, Sergey Brin's and Mark's, like one of these things is not like the other, right? And so, <clears throat> and so that's why I think as an investor too, I have always found these um, outliers. I love it, it's so much more fun. Like why, why invest in the predictable people, you know? You don't get the thrill of like sitting in front of you guys and telling these stories about these like wacky people like Rob Kalin, who was covered in cat fur, loved the guy, but he just wasn't, he's the founder of Etsy, right? He didn't seem investable, except to me, right? He was so. a student. <laughs> he was still a student when you met him. He was a student, I think he was, he had just graduated from um, Gallatin, which is a brand, uh, NYU, a college at NYU. That's crazy. Do you think that had Kickstarter existed, you would have been an author or tried to be a writer? Maybe, maybe. I don't know, I'm still writing books. You know, I have this weird schedule. I, I go to bed pretty early and um, I, I go to bed like, I don't know, 10, and then I wake up at two and then I'm awake between two and five and I write novels in the middle of the night. This is my like hobby. Do you go back to bed after? Hobby, and then I go back to bed, and then I sleep for another four, five hours. It's called biphasal sleep. It's a thing. I don't know, like Jack Dorsey's getting into it. <laughs> and that's like an endorsement. So, huh? which is, uh, you know, like he's like the lifestyle guru of Silicon Valley. I don't know if you guys read this stuff in the online, but he's like, he's like, yeah, I don't eat between Friday and Monday, and I sleep in two phases, and I only wear Rick Owens clothing, and um, he's, you know. He's the lifestyle guru of Silicon Valley. Actually, that's, a, that's I think, um, parentheses on what I was thinking of talking about, I think that that's a good example. So a couple months ago, there was this whole controversy around Jack Dorsey and his retreat. Um, I forgot what. He had gone to Myanmar, I think. Yeah, he, he had gone to like a, a yeah, and meditation posted, retreat. Yeah, and like, he posted that picture in the cave. Or and whatever. everyone was like, do you, do you understand what's going on in Myanmar? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But so that, that was a bit weird. And But then there was like a whole movement um, that was sort of went against him on social media, et cetera. And I was wondering if you had a couple comments on just the sort of behavior that that has enabled. Well, I mean, I think that in some ways, like it's, it's um, we all know feature creep, right? <laughs> you know, I, I think it's um, responsibility creep or kind of you're, you're, you're starting to take, um, this is the problem with 
you know, I haven't really thought about this until just this moment, but it's kind of the problem with social media that doesn't scale, right? It's probably appropriate for him to share his clothing choices and how he eats with a certain number of friends, but when you have like, what has he got like? Several million, millions and millions of followers, like it's just gonna land wrong, right? Like, like, there, like there's a, um, you know, communities have boundaries for a reason, right? They have kind of um, shared values. They have um, like, this is okay here and this is not okay here. And if you're like really into like monster trucks, you know those trucks on TV that like drive over each other and there's these like massive machines and the tires are as big as this room and like that, like that's one community. And then, you know, the Christian ladies quilt making society is another community. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like they have like a certain kind of like amount of shares values. And then, and then when you, when you kind of try to popularize yourself to millions of people, it's just gonna go bad. You know what I'm saying? Like there's, you know, and, and the, the, the scale of social media has gotten to the point where we have been so promiscuous and friending people and kind of getting out there and connecting. We're like so connected. Like we're more connected than maybe we should be um, or can be, frankly. You know, everybody knows the Dunbar number. The Dunbar number is, you know, this guy Robin Dunbar, neuroscientist, he's like, you can only have capacity to have, to know between 150 and 200 people, which is, this, is the size of a tribe, right? Or maybe this audience. You guys can all introduce yourselves, become friends, you know, make dinner together. But, um, but like approximately 150 people is really the limit of, of the number of people. And <clears throat> when you bring somebody new in, somebody else has to drop out. You just can't, you just don't have capacity. Like you have mental capacity for, for relationships with more than that number of people. And one of the crazy things that this has created is a huge sense of FOMO, anxiety, depression in a lot of people's lives. And I think social media keeps um, yeah. exacerbating yeah, that. Yeah, totally. And but, you know, everybody knows, everybody's, been re everybody's read their blogs and their news articles and their research studies, so we don't have to talk about the bad stuff. But, like, you know, really focus on those people that you really, really want to have. Like, I don't know, write, like, write a secret list. Don't show it to anybody because all the other people get FOMO. <laughs> but... Um, but you know, the people that you really want to have a relationship with, and make sure that you, you talk to those people and see those people like every week. I don't know, because it's so hard to do, and I think that we've, we've kind of expanded beyond our capacity to have those relationships. I think so. And, like, and what we were doing, like, you know, just to be clear, when we were building um, Flickr, we were building these kind of groups of 150, roughly. You know, we were kind of, we had lots of groups, and those, those groups were, were coherent and cohered and had their own kind of person to be the, you know, den leader kind of person. Yeah. One, one thing that I found super interesting uh, in your podcast, um, should this exist, you should all listen, uh, was your reference, so you had one on um, AI, gen or AI powered therapists. Um, and it was a yes. question of should tech solve the problems that tech has caused? Um, mm -hmm, and yeah. I was wondering if you could um, tell everyone a bit about that. Okay, so has anybody listened to this episode? I have a podcast called Should This Exist? And it's about technology and humanity. Oh my gosh, no listeners in this room? It's sort of like, <gasps> oh, I think a good you pitch is like... You and you, yes. It's, it's um, black mirror, but not just black. So it's like, you take something it's and you're like... It's black and white mirror. Exactly. It's happy, it's... Uh, rainbow it's like, this mirror. This could be great. It black could be quite so bad. It's like it's like yeah. No, it's like kind of trying to examine the full uh, kind of spectrum of what tech might do. Which is good because it's something that's missing, right? You have like super right. optimists that are like, this is going to be amazing. Why is yeah. everyone complaining about the downside? Yeah. The downside of what happened? And then you get like uh, super critical opinion pieces on the New York Times, which are like, uh, why Silicon like, Valley kill is it. fucking like, everyone Like, stick a over. knife in yeah. it. Yeah, no, it's true. And it, it, it's, very, it's really actually very difficult to, to, to put a nuanced view into media. It's really difficult, actually. Um, we well, get drowned by the radicals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it just, like, it's, like, it's kind of naturally polarizing because it's, frankly, it's entertaining. Um, a friend of mine um, 
is this guy Van Jones who is uh, on CNN, he has a show, um, he's a kind of a political commentator on, on um, American television, and he was on a show with Newt Gingrich who is like a super, super right um, kind of figure in um, American politics. And the, two, like, and the two of them are kind of um, on very different ends of the political spectrum and they were on the show that was called Crossfire and they were arguing from very, very polarized positions and Van had proposed that they have a part of the show that they close on, which was called Ceasefire, where they, where they take the best parts of the argument that the other person had presented and show how they had been convinced by them. But the TV producers wouldn't do it because it was very difficult. It just didn't make good TV, right? And so we wonder why, you know, how we, how we how we get so divided, how we end up with like, you know, kind of the, the, the America that we're living in right now and, you know, Brexit and there's like so many examples of this worldwide. Um, and so um, what we're trying to do on the show, should this exist, is actually have a kind of a nuanced discussion about um, how technology can both kind of serve and um, kind of dehumanize, frankly, humanity in many ways. And so, and you know, I'm, I'm a techno optimist I'd say I used to be one of those techno utopians. I was just kind of like in love, everything is good, we're gonna figure this out, like, you know, love, 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 possibility. I was like, I was just this kind of like possibility machine. And then things just started to go really, really not in a direction that we had thought it would go. And you know, whatever, teenage girls are now committing suicide at a rate of like 30%, like year after year, like increase, it's horrible. And this is part of part of our responsibility as kind of like the people that are building this technology. Let's go back to the AI therapist. Oh yeah, that was where we started. The AI therapist is super interesting because tech um, has created like this epidemic of depression and um, and solitude and isolation and loneliness. And um, it's a therapy bot where you where you have a um, you have a cognitive behavioral therapist, which is basically trying to kind of change your, the direction of your thoughts from something negative to something positive. And it actually lends itself very well to a AI chatbot. But what does that mean when AI starts replacing humans, right? Because humans are by their very nature not available 24 hours a day. You know, I don't know if you had a good friend who you wanted to like kind of cry on their shoulder and it was like 3 a.m. and they're like just not available. Um, or frankly, they're just sick of your hearing your problems, they're like annoyed with you, they're in a bad mood. They're flawed, <clears throat> but computers are not. Computers are always available, they will always listen, they will always um, be patient and loving and respond to you in positive ways and like they're better than people, right? They can do more, they can do, they said in the first day of um, Wobot's existence that had actually seen more, you know, clients or patients than a typical therapist could see in like their entire life in, in one day. And so, you know, should we replace ourselves? Are we too, you know, we need to sleep, you know, we're in bad moods. Like, are humans obsolete? That's the question, right? This is kind of like the conversation around this. And like, what is it about being human, um, you know, that we value and we want to preserve, right? In the face of all of this, these new kind of, you know, possibilities and kind of AI technology in particular, that's what that episode was about. And so, in the beginning, you know, <coughs> we were thinking, well, maybe at the end of the show, we decide should this exist? We answer, the answer, we answer the question yes or no. But I think it's more important to just keep asking the question. Keep asking the question, right? With every iteration, with every decision that you make, with every feature that you add, you keep on asking the question, should this exist? Should this exist? Should we do it this way? Should we do it that way? Is this being designed in a way that, you know, are we aware of the problems? that could come as a result of this. And is this software, is it bringing us closer together or is it driving us further apart? Before we open to questions from the public, I think there's um, 
two topics that I really want to cover. Um, one is homeschooling. Um, so education is a space I'm particularly interested in, um, and I'm curious of your experience as a homeschooler. Uh, and the other is women in tech. Um, so just like in many other places, France has a lot of progress to do. Yeah. Um, and you had some very interesting articles on Etsy's hiring policy. So like Etsy apparently was very focused and made a very conscious effort of hiring um, or have, hiring more female employees. Um, and I was wondering if we could uh, discuss those a bit. So first, homeschooling. What uh, prompted you to homeschool your daughter? Uh, and what have you learned doing that? Is this a thing in France? Not at all. It's because there's like tiny groups I found online, like Instruction en Famille is what it's called, right? I-E-F. And because um, I looked it up, I was kind of, I was, uh, you know, I was kind of looking around kind of the French organization. They're, they, it exists, apparently. Yeah, but it's like not as but it's like big a movement. kind of small. Yeah. Um, and I was not a good student. Um, I think maybe you can kind of tell that I wouldn't be a good student. I was a bit rebellious. I didn't like, you know, trouble with authority. You know, uh, didn't want to sit in my seat and behave. Did zines. I made zines in the back, like using the photocopy for purposes it was not intended. Um, you know, so uh, I, I, I didn't do well in school. I was actually a very um, poor student, but I was fortunate that I was really good at standardized tests. So when you take these standardized tests, I was like, off the charts, she's super smart. And then I was like, why is she failing? school. <laughs> so I was that student. Um, so I didn't really take to institutions. And then um, it was kind of accidental that my daughter, we were, I was, I was kind of traveling back and forth between San Francisco and New York. And I was a single mom. And I was fully dependent on my daughter's um, caregiver, who is this older woman in her 50s. And um, she lived in San Francisco. And I was trying to work in and, and she was like effectively my spouse. And so we were kind of traveling back and forth between San Francisco and New York and it just didn't make any sense for her to go to a school and um, her um, caregiver had been a, a preschool teacher and so she, we started just taking her to homeschool groups and things like that. But also I think being an entrepreneur, a lot of parents were kind of terrified of taking on responsibility for their <laughs> for their kids' education. I mean, it's like a big responsibility, but um, I, was, I was lucky enough when I was a kid to be in this um, gifted and talented youth program, which was this big thing that was happening when I was a kid. And I was in these classes where basically what, the way it worked was there was a, I did my regular classes in the morning and then in the afternoon there was a teacher who um, helped us figure out how to learn what we wanted to learn. So, for example, I was really interested, I was nine years old, I was really interested in um, ESP, extrasensory perception, telepathy, clairvoyance, the ability to read minds, like this, I was super into this. So you were taught that at school in the afternoon? So, no, so, I mean, <laughs> yes, because the teacher there, she joined, I lived in New Jersey, in the States, and I, I, she joined the Parapsychological Society of uh, New Jersey, and we went to their meetings. It was actually kind of amazing. You like show up and it says, um, don't knock, we already know you're there <laughs> on the door. And so like- You were you nine like, years old. I was nine and she would like take me to these meetings of this and I, I, I devised all these tests of how do you test extrasensory perception and like all this kind of stuff. I eventually concluded that um, if there was anybody out there who could bend spoons or read minds, I certainly hadn't met them because I devised all these tests. I tested all my classmates and the teachers and everybody and nobody seemed to be able to, you know, I would think really hard about like a blue tiger or something like that and they were unable to, nobody. What am I thinking about right now, guys? A blue tiger. Ah. <laughs> anyway, so, um, and, that, and that just kind of was, it's very similar to homeschooling, honestly. Like, um, you know, you, you kind of realize, um, I, have, I have these weird kind of, I'm, I'm kind of a monster about my time. Like, because I really do think that time is kind of, kind of all you have on this earth, right? To do what you do, what you with, to spend time with people, to do what you do. And um, I've always been a bit obsessed with, with managing my time, which is why I kind of do that thing in the middle of the night, which I, that crazy thing that I do. And I realized that in two hours a day, you can learn everything that you're supposed to learn 
in school, right? So why are we in school for like seven or eight hours or however long you spend? There's like all this like getting in line and like you shut up over there and like stop passing notes. Like what? Like you kind of realize that like most of school is like all of that stuff. And I'm like, what would it be? What would life be like? if you could actually take the two hours of school and then you like learn all your math and your trigonometry and you know genetics and now? basis like she, yeah she's crazy like she's doing like astro she's 11 right she's doing all these but you know you, in two hours a day you can kind of do school and then the rest of the time what do you do you like you're like, you can be Leonardo da Vinci, you can design an ornithopter, you can make, you know, you can write a play. I, when, in my gifted children's program thing, I did, like designed an orrery, like one of those things that kind of the planets rotate at the, at the proper speeds at the right distance from the sun. Um, I designed an orrery, I wrote a play, and I studied extrasensory perception, <laughs> you know, I, I, among other kind of wacky interests. And I was just able to kind of pursue those interests. And that's somewhat, it's kind of very DIY. It's very entrepreneurial. And I think it, it, it kind of creates a mental agility, right? You kind of understand yourself to be responsible for your own education. Um, you understand yourself to be responsible for continuing to learn all the time. You start to know that you can just pick up anything. You know, I call it like YouTube university. Like, I don't, like, you know, my daughter's like, you know, wants to figure out how to do, I don't know, marbling paper, you know, that beautiful Florentine paper. I was like, I don't know, just try YouTube University. Don't look at any of the stuff on the sidebar. <laughs> By the way, yeah, we radicalized the paper makers. I'm sure there's a way. <laughs> but, but seriously, there's a, there's a, <laughs> you should download this. It's called DT tube distraction, DF tube distraction free YouTube, which will kill all of the stuff on the side. Go put that on your thing so you don't get drawn into like, you know, you're going to, you're going to like arrive decent entrepreneurs and you're going to leave like, I don't know, like kind of a member of a cult. Um, and so one, do you think it's a movement? And two, if it's a movement, what's the company to build on homeschooling? A movement. Well, we talked about some already. So um, there is the DIY maker movement. So, I mean, do you think homeschooling is a movement? Oh, is homeschooling a movement? Uh, Homeschooling, it depends. I mean, I think in the U.S. definitely. I mean, like, it's crazy because out of all of the people that are sitting here in this room, probably in America, if this were a classroom, five of you would be homeschooled, right? Which is kind of seems like a lot, right? Doesn't that seem like a lot? Who is homeschooled here? You are homeschooled. Here in, the, in France? In France. Is there French as well? In Spain. In Spain. So European homeschoolers, kind of amazing. And, um, and I do think that, um, you know, there's a, there's a um, you know, fair amount of kind of government oversight and you have to make sure that your kid's actually learning what they're supposed to learn. But imagine if you could get that six hours of your day back to, to, to explore, to, I don't know, start a company like my daughter started. And it's funny because I'm an I'm a, I'm a investor and so, I get a lot of PowerPoint decks, and, and um, my daughter and my stepdaughter, they're like, what are you doing? And they're like, these are called investor decks that kind of explained what we were doing. And they're like, okay, set us up. And so we set them up, and they made um, decks for Puppy Paradise, which was they're going to be their business. They're like, this is when they're like eight years old. And <clears throat> it's like, they're going to have video services. They're going to have dog massage. They're going to have dog walking. It was like everything that have, has to do. They just love dogs. You know, like, uh, it was worthwhile. Like, I think it was like, because they had enough time to just kind of explore and play and do that kind of thing. And do you think there's so, anything that's missing in your, for you to homeschool better or that would make homeschooling easier? I don't know. I mean, like, the, the hardest part about homeschooling is actually um, driving to all of the activities and organizing carpools because she's in, like, dozens of classes and, you know, she has to go here and there and, you know, she has this very rich uh, social life, too. So, uh, you know, it's also America. It's too much driving. Not enough public, not enough public transportation in America. Jeez. <laughs> Last topic before we open the questions. Um, the hiring at Etsy. 
Um, oh, and, yeah. and the emphasis that you guys hiring made at Etsy. on okay, so, hiring So them. all these companies give like lip service to, and it kind of drives me crazy because you know you go to Google and they publish their like, you know, everybody seems to be white and male, and nobody seems to be black or brown and female, and it's just like, like and they say this right, and they kind of like publish all of their um, employee statistics, and they're dismal, and they're dismal. And they're dismal, and they're dismal year after year, right? And I'm kind of like, you know, maybe I am thinking about this in too simple of a manner, but it seems to me that the way to solve this problem is to hire the people that you say you want to hire, and if you can't find them, then you make them, you grow them, you make boot camps, you you know, there's, you know, like they, they go to the family and they kind of, you know what I'm saying? Like they learn their skills and stuff like that. So that's what we did at Etsy, right? So um, it was embarrassing. Like there was actually, it's a, it's a company that has 95% of its customers are women. And um, I was the only woman above a certain like VP level in the company, including the board. And I'm like, this is, this, like, this is wrong. Right, just it, it can't be this way. So um, then, all of the next positions that we open up are going to be filled by women. And it's funny because we went to our recruiter. There's a big recruiter, um, Diversa Partners, in New York, and we we brought them this profile. We're like, we're hiring a CFO for this company, and um, we want to hire a woman. And so, will you give us resumes from eligible women and they're like, oh, we can't do that, it's impossible, there's just like no blah, 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 pipeline, pipeline, pipeline. And they're like, we can't do it. And so we're like, just try, just try. And so literally within, um, you know, two weeks, they came back with us and there was like, what was that American politician who said this? We got binders full of women, right? We got binders full of women. Um, um, it's really funny because when I tell these jokes that are kind of like Amer based on American news stories, you guys are like, huh? <laughs> um, but um, it's so funny because they, ha they had never done a search like this before. They're like, actually, it turned out to be easier, easier than they thought. And um, so we did that, you know, also with the engineering department. And, um, you know, there's actually, there actually, it's true, actually, it's hard to recruit women engineers and I never had a problem as a as a female CEO of a tech company fully half of my engineering team was women and that was just because the CEO and founder was a woman and also the VP of engineering was a woman and we just like we turned down more women engineers than most other startups would see like in a year or like kind of on a weekly basis like so many women would apply because they knew it was a very uh, friendly environment for women their boss was going to be a you know female engineer um, and so at Etsy, what we did was, since we had uh, the so-called pipeline problem, was we basically created a, a, a kind of a Etsy coding camp. And we accepted tons and tons of women into that program. It was like not just women, it was both. Um, it was kind of everybody. And, um, and then recruited heavily out of that. And I think that we were able to really move the needle there with the, I don't remember what, the, what we finally ended up with, but it was like, it went from like being 5% women in the engineering department to, I don't know when I left, like 20, 30%. It was, it was a tremendous improvement. So, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical about these like, but we've hired a chief diversity officer at Google and we're still on it. Like, what? I mean, I, I don't know. I may be thinking about this in too simple of a way, right? Just tire more, anyway, so that's my thoughts on this. Um, before we open the questions, I'd like to, you to join me in thanking Katrina. <laughs>